Okay, let's keep going. Video three. Now we're going to have a one-dimensional chain of atoms, and on it we're going to place atomic s orbitals. And let's take a look at the crystal orbitals that result. And then we'll also relate the k vector to momentum towards the end of the video. Stay tough. In the last video, we saw that the k vector, which is equal to 2 pi over lambda, is an excellent quantitative method for counting the nodes, the number of sign changes in the crystal orbitals. And we saw also that for s orbital overlaps, the nodes correspond to anti-bonding interactions. And as k increases from 0 to pi over a, there's a systematic increase in the energy of the crystal orbital, because for pi over a, all of the orbitals are out of phase, and at zero, they're all in phase. So now let's just take a look at a suite of k values and focus more on how we can plot the energy versus the k vector. So here's, hopefully by now, our familiar k equals zero configuration for the set of atomic orbitals an infinite wavelength, everything in phase. That's the lowest energy. And as we start to introduce nodes, here, for example, is one-third pi over a with a wavelength of 6a, three pluses, three minuses, three pluses, etc. Higher energy. Here's my anti-bonding nodes. We've already seen pi over 2a corresponds to a non-bonding orbital, plus, plus, minus, minus, so higher energy. Let's put in more nodes, so we're increasing the k value now to two-thirds pi over a. Here's the arrangement of atomic orbitals that would correspond to that. And then finally, the highest energy at pi over a, everything is anti-bonding. And so we can truly give it a sigma star designation because it's completely anti-bonding. And this is the highest energy. So as k increases from zero to pi over a, the energy increases. So now we can plot the energy versus the k value, and that is a band diagram. So here's energy, here's my value of k increasing from 0 to pi over a. Here's my all anti-bonding orbital, the highest energy, all bonding, lowest energy. And along this line, we have to imagine then that there's all of these possible k value crystal orbitals, an infinite number of them. So this is my continuous band of levels. One example is halfway up, or at a k value of pi over 2a. That's we've already seen as our non-bonding crystal orbital. So that's just one of this infinite number of levels between the two extremes. Now, before in our box diagrams that we saw a couple of videos ago, we were just sketching energy versus an x-axis that didn't have any quantitative value. Now we've introduced a metric that's the best way of quantifying how anti-bonding the crystal orbitals are. And so these are EK diagrams. If this was something like sodium, where we had one s electron in the 3s orbital, in other words, the atomic orbitals were half-filled, then we'd have a half-filled band. It would be filled up to the pi over 2a k value. Now we compare the band diagram on the right with the box picture that we've had before. So our box picture, just a rectangular box sort of illustrating that I have some type of conduction band, and before if it was half filled we'd just shade it in up to that value. The figure on the right is a much better quantitative representation of what is going on. Next, let's just talk briefly about something that's called the band width. And we're going to see that that's the energy difference between the most anti-bonding and most bonding uh, crystal orbitals. So the band width, or as it's often called, the dispersion of a band, is that energy difference between the highest and lowest possible energy levels. And its value depends on the degree of overlap of the interacting atomic orbitals. If there's greater overlap, there'll be a larger band width. And specifically, this is related then to the atom-atom separation, as well as the orbital symmetry. And as the atom-atom separation decreases, going from left to right, then I have more and more overlap between the interacting atomic orbitals. 
And so therefore, my all bonding level becomes increasingly stabilized, and my all anti-bonding orbital becomes increasingly destabilized. So the energy difference between the two, delta E, from here to here, increases. And so going from left to right, what I'm actually doing is reducing my atom-atom separation, my A. So the figure on the left, there's very little overlap, there's very little dispersion, and a pretty flat band. Whereas here, where there's a lot of interaction, a shorter bond distance, a very steep band. As it turns out, although we won't get into it, the slope of the band affects the electron mobility. And if there's a larger width to the band, a larger dispersion, and a larger slope, that leads to a higher electron mobility. Often in band diagrams, we'll see the x-axis not just labeled as k, but also as momentum. So we know k counts nodes. It's also a measure of the momentum of the electron in a crystal orbital. Why? Well, this goes back to the de Broglie equation. If you remember from freshman chemistry, the de Broglie equation, lambda equals Planck's constant over m, the mass of the particle, the electron in this case, multiplied by its velocity, then just expressing mass times velocity as momentum, p, lambda is equal to Planck's constant over p. And we know with our k vector, it's involved with a wavelength. Because k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, then it's substituting in from this equation here, lambda is equal to h over p, k is 2 pi momentum over the Planck's constant, which is often written as k equals momentum over this modified Planck's constant, which is h over 2 pi. So that is why often in these diagrams, they can be labeled the momentum of the electron in that crystal orbital.